Polly and Dr. Robert Butts will come. I'll share a few things with you a little later on. And then we got everybody's favorite lunch. What's your favorite food? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Peanut butter jelly. No. <laughs> <laughs> We said, we're going to take care of all the meals and stuff and all of that. We want you to come. <laughs> but we're going to have pizza. Is that okay with everybody? So, <laughs> and, then, and then after that, we've got, we're going to go do some things. And some are going to be bowling. Some will be putt-putting. Some will be doing laser tag. So um, well, laser tag outside. It's Florida style. <laughs> Can you believe it? Yeah, it's often. <laughs> they'll have not, they'll have paramedics on call for all those. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessing on this on this time, and uh, we'll get started here in just a second. So let's pray. Father, thank you again for your goodness, and Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the opportunity we have to be together. Thank you for all these precious young people. We only can imagine what could be done through these precious lives. And I pray, Lord, that you would use this day to encourage our hearts, help us to know what we're to do. And we'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Be seated. The reason we want to have this meeting is because I really want to encourage young people. I love young people. If I wasn't a pastor, I'd be a youth director, probably run everybody out. But I love young people. I began my ministry many, many years ago working with the youth and working with young people. And I've always cherished those memories. I love, love, I love our young people. But I know that uh, the youth today are facing quite a challenge in America. And I believe this all in my heart, that only youth can carry our nation to its future. And it's going to be your job to take this great nation forward. And so we want to do everything we can to not only encourage you, but to invest in your life. And so we're here to help you and encourage your hearts. And I tell you, there's just such great potential here, great potential. And um, I really believe that God's, God's going to use. Uh, it's young people that has saved the world in every case. And so we thank God for it. Now, we're going to give you some, some, uh, some material as we get going today. And one of the things we're going to give you is a gospel track. And um, I'd like to get some folk to help me do that. Brother Matt, you can help me and some of the other guys, if you would. Some of you young men come and get a track. I want everybody to have a gospel track. Yeah, come on. You might get some in the back, Matt. And so I want you to make sure everyone gets, we have to get some more in the back and make sure everybody gets one. Uh, gospel tracks. Now, We've got them. We, we print these gospel tracts in 14 different languages. And uh, can you believe it? And would you bring me one of the Cuba tracts, Cuban tracts, Matt? Okay. And I want to make sure everybody gets one. There's plenty of them. As a matter of fact, we've got thousands of them, thousands of them printed. We've got the flag. We've got uh, the, uh, the young lady. We've got uh, children on them. And um, we've got them with different languages. But... When the meeting is over, thank you, when the meeting is over, I want you and your church to take as many as you think you can prayerfully use to reach young people in your area. We've made it where you could put your church name on it or you could put your youth group on it. How many, how many young people are, let's see, you go to public school? That's great. How many go to public school? Hold your hand up big and high. That's one. If I graduate from public school, thank the Lord. How many go to Christian school? All right. How many homeschool? How many are just taking a break from school altogether? Just, yeah, that's what everybody's done, right? <laughs> but anyway, we want you to use them, and we want you to take these gospel tracts. And when the meeting's over tonight, we'll have lots of them out on the table. And uh, we've also got a, a backpack. And um, some things we'd like for you to take, the Christian Youth Commission, a little backpack. We'll show it to you a little later on. We want you to have any of this stuff that we printed, we want you to have it and be a witness for the Lord. Now, we just finished printing this uh, beautiful track that has the Cuban flag on it. 
that says God loves you in Spanish. And um, we, uh, we are making these available for people to use and to share their faith with folk who are here from Cuba. And we've got other nations with flags on, but there's a lot going on in Cuba, so we're using that track. And so we have those available for you, too. And so we just want to be a blessing to you. Well, Brother Scott Polly is one of my favorite guys. I love being around him. And I also enjoy his preaching. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding you. Uh, he, he spoke for us yesterday in both services. Did a great job. I uh, thank the Lord for him. And uh, he, he has taken out of his schedule to be with us. And he's going to come and share some things with you this morning, get started. And then we'll have some other things as we move along. God bless you, Scott. Thank you very much. If our pianist will stay there just for a second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Good morning, everybody. Oh, this is an enthusiastic group. This is a tremendous crowd today. I'm really excited about it. And hope you're excited about it. We're going to have a lot of fun together. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to move you around just a little bit. All right? So now that you're comfortable and settled and really happy with the person you're next to, I want you to tell the person to your left and right goodbye right now. Just tell them goodbye. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Tell them we shall meet again in a little while. Very good. Now, here's what we're going to do. Look at me just a second. We're going to have a little fun. And if you don't participate, I'm going to bring you to the front and make you sing before I preach today. All right? And I get to pick the song. So... Be careful what you volunteer for. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, I'm going to point to the piano, and when I do, they're going to play something. Something peppy. Something lively. Something Christian. All right? So, I need a little moving music. How many of you have ever played musical chairs in your life? Good. This is not musical chairs. All right? But here's what's going to happen. It's kind of a version of it. When she starts playing, hits the first note, you've got to jump up. Gather all your things. Go ahead. Gather all your things. Don't leave anything. You're not coming back where you are for a little bit. Get your purses, fellas, and your makeup kits and all that kind of stuff and be ready. Okay, now look at me just a second. When she hits the first note, pay attention now, pay attention. When she hits the first note, you're going to jump up. You have to speak to seven people you've not seen today and say hello to them, all right? You don't, now look. You don't have to have a long conversation. Just good morning. Nice to see you. Smile. Finish this verse. He that hath friends must first show himself friendly. So we're going to work that a little bit today. Because look at me just a second. You can't be a witness if you're not a friendly person. Mean people are not a good testimony for Jesus. So everybody, let's try to smile one time. That's nice. Very good. Look at your neighbor. Stare at them. It'll give you something to laugh about. All right? Just smile at them for a second. Good. So... You are going to leave where you are. You are going to speak to seven people you have not seen this morning. And then, this is the most important part. Shh. This is the most important part. Then, you must choose a partner. You must find someone that is not from your church. I know, it's rough, isn't it? Somebody that you do not know well. Let me lay down another ground rule because I see some boys looking around like, oh, my prayers have been answered. We are not concluding today with a marriage ceremony, all right? So, uh, guys, you must find another guy. Girls, you can thank me later, all right? And girls, you must find another girl. Now, here's the way it's going to work. When I say go, you go. When I say stop, the music will stop. And if you have not spoken to seven people and found a new partner and seated with them, then you get to come to the front and participate in my very special uh, teen retreat ensemble, all right? And so, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Now, no pushing, no shoving, but when, when I say stop, you must have a partner and you must be seated with it. Oh, look at me just a second. Shh, shh, look, 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 look. Let's do this. I want everybody as near the front as possible. I do want you to spread out a little bit so you're not just right on top of each other. But let's say that you've got to be in the first, uh, let's say, five or six rows of every section. We'll use all four sections so everybody's as near to the front as possible, okay? And I'm talking a little bit, giving folks who are in the lobby time to come in and join us because I want them to know what we're doing. You friends that are just coming in, we're glad you're here. Everybody's getting ready to get a partner, okay? So when I say go, you've got to find a partner. And guys with guys, girls with girls, and it can't be from your church, ready in your mark, get set, Go.
Hurry now. What thou doest, do quickly. Hurry, hurry, hurry. You got about 30 seconds. 30 seconds now. Find a partner. Guys, find a guy. Girls, find a girl. And then everybody find a seat. Make sure you got a Bible with you. In your team, you need a Bible. Everybody's got to have a Bible. Good. Good, 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 good. Find a partner, find a seat, find a partner, find a seat, find a partner, find a seat. You gotta be near the front, as near the front as possible. Use all four sections. 15 seconds. Hurry now. Yeah, you don't have to like the person, you don't even have to like the way they look. Just gotta find a partner, all right? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I'm going to help you, all right? Uh, good. Yeah, I'm not going to make you sing. All right? How many girls need a partner? Would you raise your hand? I'm looking now. Got one right back there. There's your partner. Very good. Any other young ladies need a partner? I'm looking. You got to have one. Got to have a partner. Any other young lady not have a partner? I'm looking, 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 looking. Good. You girls together? Wonderful. And any young man not have a partner? Would you raise your hand, please? Any fellas not have a partner? I'm just looking. Anyone? Good. You did well. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate your your uh, peppy playing this morning. It was fantastic. Now, here's what we're going to do. We've got to get acquainted, all right? So, uh, spread out just a little bit from the other team next to you, all right? So, you're not just like sitting like this, because you're going to do a lot of talking today, and I want there to be some room. So, like, if you're packed in like sardines in a pew, there's pews where there's not quite as many people. You can move around if you need to do that, all right? Uh, let's do this. Elect a captain in your team, all right? There must be a captain in your team. So, hold an election, Campaign at 10 seconds. Hold a vote. Five, four, three, two, one. Stop. Captain, raise your hand, please. In every team, there must be a captain. Somebody's got to lead the way. Good, 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 good. Captain, 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 captain. Who's the captain right here in the middle here? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And who's your partner? You don't have a partner. Oh, is there another young lady that needs a partner or lady that needs a partner? Any ladies back there need a partner? Anyone right over here? Good. I got your partner. Come with me right now. Come on. I'm going to help you. That's wonderful, isn't it? Yes. Right back here. Wait, wave at us. Would you, would you put your hand up? Who, who needs a partner right there? See her right here. Good. She looks like a nice person too. Anybody else need a partner? All right. Good. Captain, raise your hand. You need a partner? Oh, there's three. Is there, yeah, if, if it'd be two, that'd be better. Is there any other young lady that needs a partner? Anyone? Just, I'm just talking to girls right now. Any other girls need a partner? All right, good. You're fine then. All right, so Captain, raise your hand again in every team. Captain, raise your hand. Wonderful. All right, thank you for your volunteer spirit. Captain, you can put your hand down. You're just going to sit and listen first, all right? And the partner gets to go first. And some of our veterans knew what was up there. And they set up some of you first-timers. Partner, here's what I want you to do. I want you to share three things with your captain. Number one, I want you to share your full name and any nicknames that you go by, all right, as long as they're appropriate in church. So your full name and any nicknames. Then I want you to share with them something about where you are from, something interesting about where you are from. And then thirdly, something unique, something unusual about yourself. Now, if you look funny, that doesn't count. They know that already, all right? So something they would not know by just glancing at you that is unique and unusual. And only the partner can talk. And, Captain, you're just going to sit there, smile, and listen, ready on your mark, get set, go. All right, stop. Captain, it's your turn. Same three things. Ready on your mark. Get set. Go. All right, stop. 
Now lift your head and look back at me. We're going to do more talking to each other as the, as the day progresses. I'm just trying to get you acquainted. Uh, how many of you think you picked the wrong partner? Would you raise your hand? Anybody? <laughs> Some of you looking at each other like, oh, I don't know how I got with this person, but I did. Let's just say it's the good providence of God for you, all right? I'm trying to help you, look please, there's method to the madness. This is not just for fun. Trying to help you get out of yourself a little bit and learn that when you get out of your comfort zone, when you get out of your click, when you get out of your, your familiar environment, God can use you. Now, tomorrow, many of you are starting back to school. Some of you, different school districts, starting different days over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but it's starting. Like it or not, it's starting, right? And uh, you're going back. But I want to tell you what I think you're going to. I think you're going to the greatest mission field in our country. In fact, I'm more convinced than ever that the greatest mission field we have is the school system of our nation. And I believe something, and this is an amazing crowd today, but I believe if we could just get the young people in this auditorium today to say, I will be the Lord's witness. I will be a, a gospel goer. I will be a missionary at my school this year or with my friends or on my ball team or on my part-time job or in my neighborhood. There is no telling how many people the Lord could use you to bring to Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about other things in the meeting tonight, but this morning we're going to zero in on something. We're going to really concentrate on something, and that is getting the gospel out and bringing people in. And one of the fellows here on the front asked a minute ago if this was my net, and uh, the answer is no, it's not my net. This is what this church is using right now to receive their offering. I like it. I watched them yesterday. It goes right down the aisle. Isn't that good? Which means everybody can give to the offering. But let me tell you what we're trying to do. We are trying to teach you to cast the gospel net. Remember what Jesus said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. We're trying to teach you how to cast the gospel net and then not only cast it, but draw it. In other words, to get out the truth, and then to seek to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to begin with a verse of Scripture this morning. I want you to open your Bible with me, would you please? And make sure you've got a Bible in your team. If for some reason two of you got together and neither of you have a Bible, I want you to borrow one from another team so that every team has a Bible to look on. I hope you have your own copy if possible. By the way, when you go to school, carry your Bible with you. I know, I know. There's a Bible on this. Somebody said, I got a Bible on here. I do too. And I use it on airplanes and lots of places. But I want you to know, there's something wonderful about carrying a copy of God's Word with you. So when you put your books in your backpack, carry a Bible with you. You'll be glad you have it. Here's our verse today. It's found in the book of Romans in the New Testament. So if you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, the very next book is the book of Romans. Romans is a a book, frankly, that I think a lot of young people stay away from because they think, man, that's really deep. That's, that's a lot of theology. But I want to tell you that, that God's great truths are truths you need to know. And not only do you need to know them yourself, you need to make them known to other people. And the amazing thing about the book of Romans, we use it with lost people, right? Have you ever heard of the Romans road? Have you ever heard of the Romans road? All right, so we say Romans 3.23, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the Romans road. Romans chapter 10, verse number 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you, you walk through these great verses with lost people. But I've noticed something in the book of Romans recently, and it is this. It's not just for lost people. In fact, the book of Romans was not written primarily to unsaved people. It helps them to know God. But it was written to believers in a pretty rough place called Rome. In fact, Rome was a lot like America today. Wicked, vile, uh, immoral. If you walked through the streets of Rome in Paul's day, you would have been shocked by what was front and center, what was paraded through the streets. I mean, it was... It was lewd and ugly and crude, and you would say, I don't know if God can do anything here. And yet, the amazing thing is that in Rome, many, many people came to know Christ as their Savior, and God established a strong church in Rome during Paul's lifetime, during his ministry. 
I want to say to you, no matter how bad you may think our nation is, and no matter how messed up a generation may be, and no matter how sinful or wicked your school may appear to be, the gospel has the power to change people's lives and eternal destinies. And so, when you come to the book of Romans, it's not just for us to say, this is good for lost people. No, no. This is a message for us. Here's our verse. Romans 1 and verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I want you to take your pen and I want you to circle a phrase in verse number 16. It is this little phrase, the gospel of Christ. Now, the word gospel is a great word. It means good news. It's a happy word, literally. There's a whole lot of bad news. Anybody sick of hearing bad news? Anybody sick of hearing people talk about how bad things are? May I tell you that in a bad world, we still have a good God. And the gospel is God's good news. But don't miss it. Look at the phrase you just marked. It's not just the gospel. It is what? The gospel of Christ. It is not just something that people need to know. It is someone that people need to know. We're not just trying to get them to your church. We're not just trying to get them to a youth meeting. We're not just trying to get them to be better people. We're trying to introduce them to Jesus Christ because here's what we know. We can't change anybody's life. I can't change anybody's life. Oh, but Jesus can radically change your life forever. People need the good news that is found in Jesus Christ. Now, let's do something. Go to the end of the verse. Let's start at the end and go backwards, all right? Because I'm, I'm going to show you how this truth kind of unfolds. So start at the end of the verse. What do we learn first about the gospel of Christ? We learn first that it is for everyone. You can't give the gospel to the wrong person. I'm going to tell you why that is. Because everybody's a sinner and everybody needs a Savior. So the end of the verse says this. It's to the Jew first and it's also to the Greek. I personally am glad that God sent the message to the Gentiles. How many Gentiles are here? Would you raise your hand? All right. Let me ask it differently. How many of you are not a Jew? Would you raise your hand? Okay. If you're not a Jew, guess what? You're a Gentile. All right. So it goes to Israel, to the Jew first, but God's heart is a heart for all people. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves everybody. Christ died for every man. First Timothy says, God's not willing. He wants all men to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Peter says, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when it says to the Jew first, and also you're in that praise God for the also which means that the people at your school that are a lot like you and the people at your school who are not like you at all, God loves them equally. You know, there's a lot of talk in our world right now about inequality. There's a lot of talk about how to fix racism. There's a lot of talk about how to fix prejudice. By the way, Truth is, everybody has some prejudices. And I'm going to tell you why that is. Because we're all sinners and we all look through a fallen lens. Which means when we see people, we see them through our own context and our own experience and our own ideas. Instead of seeing them like God sees them. But can I tell you what fixes all prejudice? The gospel of Christ does. There is nothing more equal than the message of Jesus. Because everybody gets saved the same way. There's an old preacher in West Virginia who used to say, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. I like that. So we know the gospel of Christ is for everybody. Back up again. Look at verse number 16. Here's something else we learn. People have to believe the gospel to be saved. Look at it. It's the power of God unto salvation to who? To everyone that believeth. So it's not enough that we simply say, well, we have the gospel. No, no. People must believe the gospel. And they have to believe it for themselves. Let me tell you what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that they believe there is a God. Most people that you meet, some people are going to say they're atheists, but most people you're going to meet are going to say, well, I believe at least there's a higher power. I believe out there somewhere there's something, someone that made all this, or uh, we're going to you know, meet the higher power someday. They believe in something. That is not enough for people to know God personally. And I'll tell you why. The book of James says that even the devil believes and trembles. Can I just tell you something shocking? Satan actually believes more than most people do. And I'm going to tell you why. Because he's seen more than we've seen. 
So the devil knows there's a real God, but he's not a Christian. He's not a follower of that God. So when we say believe the gospel, what do we mean? Look up here just a second. This is what it means. It means literally put all your weight on him. Acts 16, 31. What must I do to be saved? Believe on, not in, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What does that mean? It means literally I'm resting everything on him. Nothing else is, is the thing I'm trusting or depending on for my soul salvation. Not baptism or church or youth group or me being good. It's all on Jesus. Now, I'm not going to take for granted that everybody in this room even knows the Lord personally. There could be somebody who came today that you are not a believer in the way I'm talking about. May I just tell you, if that's true of you, then today the first step for you is you need to believe on Christ for yourself because you can't give what you don't have. You can't share what you haven't experienced. Probably hmm, 12 years ago, maybe longer, I was in New England, and I was in uh, Connecticut, and I had a big group of young people, and uh, just off the cuff at the end of a meeting, I said, let's all share our testimony with one another, which is something I'm going to have you do in a little bit. And I didn't know, but in the back of the room, there were two girls sitting together, and the, the first girl shared her story of salvation, how she came to believe on Jesus and become a Christian. When she finished, the other girl, and I respected this so much. You know, it's, it's terrible to lie, especially about God or about your faith. This girl was an honest person. She looked her partner in the face, her friend, and she says, I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't really have a testimony. I don't know for sure I'm saved. And her friend, who was a Christian, says, well, you can get saved today just like I got saved. And in the back of the room, while everybody around is talking to each other and sharing their story, those two girls are praying on the back row, and that girl trusted Jesus as her personal Savior. May I say, if there's somebody in here today and you're not sure that you are saved, let's start there. Make sure that you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can be saved today. Today's the day of salvation. Now's the accepted time because everybody has to believe for themselves, and nobody can do that for you. Let's back up again. Look at verse 16. Not only is the gospel for everybody, and you have to believe it to be saved, but notice this. The gospel is powerful enough to save anyone. Look what the Bible says. He says, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Another verse says, that is able to save to the uttermost. Literally, for all time, for all eternity, it reaches down no matter where you are. It is deeper, it is broader, it is wider, it is higher, it is longer than anything else on earth because it's connected to the eternal God. That's why it's called everlasting life. And you may look at somebody and say, I don't know about them, but I want you to know the gospel breaks hardened hearts transforms wicked lives, changes dirty minds, uh, reorders wrong priorities. It, it changes everything, both now and for all eternity. And why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that to give you hope this year that you have what your friends need. You know what I've discovered right now? Everybody's searching. People are looking for hope. Where are they going to get it? Now, if you know Jesus, you have it. You might bottle it all up inside and not share it with anybody. Every 38 seconds, another teenager has attempted suicide in America. Suicide is up 300% from my dad's generation. Depression's on the rise. Can you imagine young people thinking they have nothing to live for? For the record, Solomon said a living dog is better than a dead lion. As long as you're breathing, there's still hope for you. So suicide's never the answer. I had a friend take his own life a few weeks ago. A personal friend. He got to the place, he was not a young man, he got to the place where he thought he had nothing to live for. You know what that is? That's a lie of the devil. And maybe some of you have thought it. I want you to know there is hope in the gospel of Christ. And there's not only hope for you, there's hope for everybody. And everybody needs hope. Everybody needs the truth that cuts through the lies, the clarity that cuts through the confusion. What is that? It's the gospel of Christ. But now we get down to where we live. Because, see, you can sit in here today and nod your head at me and believe everything that I've just showed you from this verse. But if you miss the beginning of it, then you miss your role in it. Everybody look at the beginning of verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. If the gospel's for everybody and people have to believe it to be saved and it's powerful enough to save everybody, then write this one down, would you please? We must not be ashamed of it. Our job 
is to get the gospel to everyone. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved, everybody's going to believe, but it means everybody deserves the opportunity to hear about Jesus at some point and have the privilege to make their own decision whether they're going to accept or reject the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. And those who have are the ones who are supposed to give. If you don't have this marked in your Bible, would you mark this? Take your pen out and mark the first three words of verse 14. There's three I am's here. Verse 14, he says, I'm debtor. I'm debtor, both to the Greeks, to the barbarians, both the wise, the unwise. Why are you a debtor, Paul? Because to have is to owe. How many of you know Jesus as your Savior? Raise your hand big and high. You know it as your Savior. How many of you are glad somebody told you about Jesus? Okay, then you're a debtor. You have a debt to give others what has been given to you. You're a debtor. Here's the second one. Look at verse 15. So as much as in me is, mark these three words, I am ready. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Are you ready? Are you sitting on ready? By the way, ready is not so much about having it up here, it's about having it in here. Now we're having this gospel emphasis day to encourage you and equip you and get you ready because a lot of people say, well, I just don't know what to say, preacher. I don't know how to start. I don't know what to do. I'm not a preacher. I hear that all the time. All right, we're going to fix that today. When you're done today, you're going to at least know where to start. You may not have all the answers, but you're going to have at least an entry point. This phrase has always interested me in verse 15, as much as in me is. God doesn't expect you to give what you don't have. He just expects you to share what you do have, what's in you. Is Christ in you? Then if Christ is in you and he's big in your life, that ought to be coming out in the way you speak and what you want to share with other people. But I return to what I said a moment ago. Being ready has less to do with having a head full of knowledge or a page full of notes, and it has more to do with having a heart so full of Jesus you want everybody else to know him. Are you a debtor? Yes. Are you ready? We hope. But then mark this one, verse 16. I am not ashamed. Are you ashamed? Of Jesus. At Calvary, he hung naked on a cross as they mocked and jeered him. And all he could say were things like this, Father, forgive them. He was not ashamed of you. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus was not ashamed of us there, why are we ashamed of him here? If he was willing to take your sin, your death, your hell that he didn't deserve, and give you eternal life and his righteousness and his joy and his peace with God, then why on earth would we be ashamed to share that with somebody else? The reality is it ought to be the most natural thing in, a wor in the world for people who know Jesus to want to talk about him. Like, I like talking about my wife. You know why? I really love her. Like, in my, in my messages, I frequently reference Morgan and Lauren and Grant, our children. Do you know why? Because I love them. See, people that you love, you want to talk about. And I love what the Bible says later in the New Testament about the apostles, that they could not help but speak the things they'd seen and heard. That's what I'm praying for today. I'm praying God will raise up an army of gospel witnesses that will charge into the greatest mission field in America this year, and they just can't help themselves. They want to tell somebody about Jesus and get the gospel out. But you've got to come to the place where you say, I am not a shame. Now, let me just tell you a little something about that before we go any further. I get nervous. To not be ashamed does not mean not nervous. Some people think at some point I won't be nervous anymore. Yeah, you will. I'm 44 years old. I still get nervous striking up a conversation with people. I still get nervous. But here's what I've discovered. Once I start, God helps me. So one of the great secrets is just learning how and where to start. So today... I want to give you two little tools, all right? You have them already, whether you realize it or not. But today, I want to give you two little entry points for the gospel that you can take and you can use this year, and we're going to learn today how to use them more effectively. If you have something to write with and something to write on, I want you to take it out right now because I want you to jot a few things down today if you can take some notes. And if not, I want you to pay real close attention, try to keep as much of this in your mind as possible, and we'll talk about the two, the two tools. First of all, you have gospel tracks. How do you use gospel tracks? You know, tracks are amazing things because they go where you can't go and they stay after you're gone. It is literally the written word of God. And it's powerful. And, and the powerful thing is not what we write in it. The powerful thing is what the Lord writes in it. And I mean by that scripture, God's word being given to them. 
The track I have in my hand right now is a track that Pastor Sexton gave you today that they're going to make available to you that you can carry. It's very simple. I mean, very simple. It's full of Scripture, which is important. And most of all, it's all about Jesus. Uh, in the back on the, on the uh, table, I have a little gospel track that I have written and I carry with me all the time. And I like using it. I like saying, this is something I wrote about knowing Jesus. You know, when I say that to people, I hardly ever have somebody say to me, they won't take it. Because usually they'll say, you wrote this? Now, you may not have written a track, but you can find one that has been written that is good, like this one, and you can learn to use it. So let's start here. How many of you have ever given out a track in your life? Would you raise your hand? Okay, that's good. Uh, let me give you a few suggestions, all right? Just a few hand, handful of practical suggestions. Number one is this, carry them with you. This is deep. You ready? Really profound. You can't give out tracks you don't have. So how many times have I thought, oh, I should speak to that person about the Lord and didn't have any gospel literature on me? And so my recommendation, when you leave here today, you ought to take a huge stack of these, huge. Now, don't waste them. Uh, don't, don't bend them up and, you know, throw them in the back seat of the car, but if you'll carry them, put them in your backpack, put them in your pocket, have them in your car, wherever you can have easy access to them, carry them with you. I'll tell you what it will do. Number one, you'll be ready to speak to people, but number two, they will actually serve as reminders for you as well. See, when I have tracks in my pocket, it's a reminder to me, oh, wait, I need to be talking to people about the Lord. It's like a little memory device. So I'm going to recommend to you that you take as many of these as possible, and the pastor will talk to you more about this particular track a little later. But number one, you need to carry them. Here's another little suggestion on using the track. Pray over each one you give out. When I give one, and by the way, you don't just throw them out the car window as you drive down the road, all right? That's not a good way. That's called littering, not witnessing, okay? So when I give a track to somebody, I literally pray, even as I'm giving it to them or after I've given it to them, dear Lord, use that. Dear Lord, speak to that person. Dear Lord, use that gospel witness in their heart. So you're planting gospel seed and you're watering, watering it with your prayers. Then another suggestion I would give you is this. Look for appropriate times and opportunities. I remember years ago we took a group of teenagers to an amusement park. And we were having a lot of fun. And we got on a roller coaster. And we had a boy in our youth group named Frank who really got on fire for God. I mean, he was stirred up, sold out, wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. And we got on the, the most frightening roller coaster in the, in the entire amusement park. Frank's sitting behind me next to a stranger, a guy he doesn't know. And we're going up that first incline. How many of you know the pit in your stomach? You know what I'm talking about. It's just like, you know, dummy, why'd you even get on this thing? I mean, this, is, this, is, this was the dumbest thing you've ever done. And it was a high one. And we're about halfway up the first incline. All of a sudden, I heard Frank behind me muster up the courage and boldness to start witnessing. And Frank literally said to the guy next to him, hey, buddy, if you died right now, are you sure you go to heaven? Man, that guy let out an oath and cussed all the way through the first two loops. It was not a good situation. We got off the ride, and I said to Frank, I said, I appreciate your zeal, but let's choose our times a little more carefully, you know? If you died right now, not a good entry point on a roller coaster. But... You're looking for appropriate opportunities. And by the way, here's something I learned. If you'll ask, God will give you one. If you will ask, Lord, give me a divine appointment, the Lord will give you opportunities and he'll prompt you of when to do it. Another little suggestion I would give is that you always offer a gospel piece of literature in a kind way. Never, never like, here, I'm gonna give you something to read. Friendly, kind. Uh, I, let me tell you the line that I use more than any other to give out gospel literature. And, and for the record, I don't use the word tracks with people. People don't know what a track is. We use that term. Outside church, people don't, they don't know the word track. So here's what I say. I say, can I give you something encouraging to read? Now, let me tell you what I've discovered. In our world, everybody needs encouragement because everybody's having a hard time. And when you begin that way, can I give you something encouraging to read? They know, number one, you're interested in them, not just selling them something. And number two, they're thinking, wonder what's encouraging in this. So what you're doing, remember, you're going fishing for, for men. You're dropping a hook in the water. You're trying to catch souls for the Lord in the right kind of way. So you want to begin in a kind and a friendly way. Then keep it personal. This is something that I've tried to do through the years. Every track you give out, you need to have read. You need to know what's in it. And a lot of times I'll say to people, I, I do this frequently, like at a hotel, I'll check in. 
And I'll say to the guy, we'll chat a little bit, talk about other things. And then I'll say, hey, man, I want to give you something to read. This, this really tells you about what God did in my life. God changed my life. And I love talking about him. And, and what's in this little brochure, this, this made the biggest impact on my life. Well, I've discovered when you make it personal that way, then they don't think, you know, that you're just doing your duty, passing out pieces of paper for your church. No, no, it's a personal word. It's person to person. It makes your witness more powerful. And then I would say this, if possible, let it open up a conversation. In other words, sometimes you can give a track and it will, it will prompt something. I've given people tracks on airplanes before. I remember a guy I'm flying next to is a businessman and very wealthy man. And you could tell the way he was dressed, the things he had with him, and he had on his headphones the whole flight, and drinking like a fish. And I, I finally mustered up enough courage, frankly, to at least give him a track. Couldn't, I didn't feel like I'd get a conversation started, so I thought I'm not going to let him get off this plane with at least a piece of gospel literature. And so we're flying along, and he still got his headphones on, not looking at me, and I just went like this. And he looked at the front of the track. The little track I wrote says, would you like a new start? He immediately took his headphones off, turned to me, and I'm thinking, I wonder what he's going to say. And he said, he holds up that, that piece of literature, and he said, this is exactly what I've been looking for. And I said, excuse me? And here's what he said to me. He said, you don't know me. He said, but I, I'm a businessman. And he said, I, I've got lots of businesses. And he said, I'm flying to one of our vacation homes now. He said, i got lots of stuff. He said, but he said, I'm going to be honest with you, sir. He said, I, I need a new start. He said, something's missing. You know what it did? It immediately started a conversation about Christ. Not about church, about Christ. And you got to remember, when you're passing out gospel literature, it's not just about your church, it's about Jesus. So you're working to offer gospel literature to people to try to invite them to know Christ. And then one other suggestion I would give is when you give a track, if you can follow up on that person, do so. I'm going to tell you something I say to people sometimes, especially if it's somebody I know. I'll say to them, hey, man, let me give you something to read, and in a few days, let's talk again, and I want you to tell me what you think about this. All right, what that's doing, it's giving a little accountability, like I'm expecting him to actually read it, right? Because I'm going to ask him about it again and see what his thoughts are on it, and I've discovered that many times, this is not the end, this is the entry point, but you can carry gospel literature to your school, you can give gospel literature to friends, and you can do it in such a way, look, the gospel may offend people. They may not agree with the message in it, but you can do it in a way that's not offensive to get the gospel out and invite people to know Jesus as their personal Savior. So let's practice, all right? Get your gospel track out. Everybody get your gospel track out. You got one. It's really well done. I love this track, and you'll hear more about it a little later today. Wave it in the air at me. I want to see you got it. You got it, got it, got it, got it. Very good, very good. Now listen to me. This is valuable. Don't bend it. Don't tear it. Don't write on it because you're going to give this one to somebody. Now let's practice with your partner. How many of you remember your partner's name? I'm just curious. Would you raise your hand? How many of you are like me and you've already forgotten their name? Would you raise your hand? Yeah, well, you'll have to ask again, all right? So here's what I want to do. Let's practice just giving a track. Listen to me. Shh, look at me. I want to practice just giving a track, and you can do it like they're a stranger. So you can reintroduce yourself. Hey, my name's Scott. What's your name? Josh, good to meet you. Josh, I want to give you something encouraging to read about knowing Jesus. This really changed my life. I hope you'll read it. I will. Thank you. All right, so look, 15 seconds. That's all it was. That was quick, right? You don't have to say a lot. You don't have to go into some big elaborate thing. And by the way, when, when your person's practicing with you, don't raise your hand and say, I'm a Mormon and I have a few questions, all right? Don't do that to them. Not today, all right? And remember, you, you reap what you sow. you got to go next, all right? Let's let the captain go first. Captain, however you want to say it, listen to me. Don't be a robot. Be yourself. Everybody say that. Don't be a robot. Be yourself. I think sometimes we make everybody do it the same way and say it a certain way. And somebody says, I don't know if I can get this right or not. I'm so scared. All right, let's take a survey. How many of you know how to talk? Would you raise your hand, please? Okay, then you know how to do what I'm saying. Okay, make it your own, captain only. Ready, on your mark, get set, go. All right, stop. Look at me. Partner, how many of you partners say captain did a pretty good job? Did the captain do a pretty good job? All right, it's your turn. Ready? Partner, on your mark. Get set. Go.
All right, stop. Look back at me. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room would say, Brother Scott, I don't know if I could give a sermon. I don't know if I could give a speech or lecture about it. But I think I could at least give out one of these pieces of gospel literature to somebody. How many think you could do that? Okay, watch this. If all of us would just do that, carry the gospel literature, speak to people about the Lord, get the gospel out, you never know how God could use this. You never know what the Lord will do. I have met so many people through the years that have personally, personally been saved because somebody left a gospel track somewhere or somebody handed them a piece of gospel literature. You never know what God will do. God always blesses his word. God bless you. <laughs> Yesterday, no, no, Saturday, I was flying from North Carolina to here. I got on a plane. I got in my seat. A lady came down the aisle, and she said, I'm there. And I stood up, let her in. She was very kind. And when she sat down, I immediately started thinking, because I try to do it on every flight, how I could begin a conversation with this woman with the goal, not just of getting to know her, I wanted to be friendly to her, but to speak to her about her soul, at least to get the gospel to her. So we started talking. And within a matter of 60 seconds, before I could ever get to spiritual things, this is what she says to me. She said, I'm headed to Fort Myers because my mother-in-law just passed away. And I said, I'm so sorry to hear that. And then before I could say anything more, she said to me, her face lit up, she said, oh, yes. She said, but three days before she died, my husband and I had the opportunity to lead her to Jesus. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I'm thinking I'm going to talk to her about Christ. She's already talking to other people about Christ, and she is totally unashamed to tell me about it. She doesn't know who I am. She doesn't know what I do for a living. Of course, when she found out that I was a preacher, that opened up a whole other conversation. She was quite a Christian lady. And um, she, she was just so excited, just so excited. And so we talked for a long time, and at some point on the flight, she said to me, when we leave Florida, we're flying from Florida to California. She said, my husband's already in Florida with his family. We're flying from Florida to California. And I said, really, why are you going to California? This is what she said. I mean, it blew me away. She said, because we had the opportunity to lead my husband's family to the Lord. And she said, my family's in California, and my family doesn't know Jesus. And she said, so we figured while we were at it, we're just going to go on and talk to my family and try to lead my family to Jesus. That's powerful stuff. And she said to me, she said, at this stage, she's not an old woman, middle-aged lady. She said, at this stage, she said, I'm starting to realize that some things really matter and other things don't. And she said, I want to make sure that everybody that God's put in my path has the opportunity to know Jesus and go to heaven when they die. And I thought, now that's a woman who, who's figured something out. That's a woman who's living in Romans 1.16. And then she said to me, would you pray for me? She said, because I've got a family member in California that is Buddhist background, very confused, searching for truth, and we feel like we've said everything we know to say and can't get through to her. And I said to her, that's very interesting. I said, could I give you two suggestions? I'll pray, but could I give you two suggestions? And I said, in fact, these are the two suggestions I'm going to give to a whole bunch of young people in South Florida on Monday morning. I was already thinking about what I was going to talk to you about today. She said, of course. I said, there are two things that you can use to get the gospel to people. Outside of just talking and trying to explain, there's two things that you can do that are powerful. The first is get them to read the Bible for themselves. I really believe that. That's where this comes in. You're not giving them a whole Bible, but you're giving them enough Bible that they could read the Scriptures. For example, everybody look at this track just a second. Would you look at the track? In it, there's lots of Bible verses. You'll know they're Bible verses because they're italicized. Uh, some are in red. Some are in black, depending on words of Christ or not, but it's all the Word of God, and they're italicized with a Scripture reference, so if you needed to find it in your Bible to explain more or look at the verses around it, you could do that, and you ought to familiarize yourself with that. But let me tell you something. There is power in this right here. Look, there's power in this right here. This is just a little part of this right here. 
But when you get in the Word and the Word gets in you, the Word of God begins working on people. Years ago, I was trying to lead a guy to the Lord named Gene. Whew, man, I was burdened for Gene. I really was trying to lead him to Christ. I said everything I knew to say. I answered every question I thought he had. I mean, I just I couldn't get him there. Be honest. How many of you have a family member or friend, you feel like you've talked to him about Jesus, you've said everything you know to say, and you feel like you're at a dead end? Anybody? All right. I said to Gene, I was in his home on a, maybe Thursday night or something. I said, Gene, you got a Bible? He said, sure. I said, go get it. He goes and gets his Bible, brings it out. And remember, to this point, it's been me and him talking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. God's got to speak. The Bible, the word is the hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. So I, I said to him, let's, let's find a book. And I found the gospel according to John. John 3.16 is the key verse in this gospel track. It's probably the, the most powerful gospel verse, one verse in the whole Bible. I found the gospel according to John. It's 21 chapters long. And I said to Gene, I want to make a deal with you. He said, all right, what's that? I said, my part of the deal is I'm going to pray for you every day. Your part of the deal is that I want you to read one chapter in this book every day for the next three weeks. You'll read through the whole book of John in three weeks, one chapter a day. We made a deal. We shook on it. I remember that night I left his home. I was so burdened for him. I literally, and this, this does not happen often, not often enough. But I pulled over the side of the road and I cried and I prayed for Gene. I was so burdened to see him saved. Are you burdened to see somebody saved? So anybody whose name or face is on your mind right now, God brought that person into your life. God brought that person to your mind. On Sunday, I was standing on the platform next to the pastor, and I looked down, and there was Gene. I can see him now, Gene and his wife sitting right there about three rows back in the middle section. The pastor got up, preached the gospel, gave a gospel invitation. Gene didn't move. I didn't want to embarrass him. I'm not into that. But I loved the man. I wanted to see him come to Jesus. And whenever his head was bowed and nobody was looking, I went to him quietly and put my arm around him. And I said, Gene, wouldn't you like to trust Jesus today as your Savior? And this is what he said. No, I've already done that. I said, hold up just a second. I said, I was just at your house on Thursday night. You told me you weren't ready to do that. He said, I know. He said, funny thing about that. He said, when you left, he said, I took that book. What was it, John? I said, yes, John. He said, and I went on the back porch, and he said, I thought, well, I'll get my first chapter out of the way for today. And he said, I thought I'll just read that chapter and be done. Then he said, I started reading in John, and he said, it was so interesting. He said, I, I read John 1 and John 2 and John 3. He said, before I realized, he said, you know, I read all 21 chapters. And he said, when I finished reading, he said, it was just like a light came on. He said, all those things you'd been trying to explain to me, it was like suddenly now they all made sense. And he said, so I got down on my knees on my back porch, and he said, I asked Jesus to be my Savior. Now, God saved him, and I rejoice in that, but God also taught me something. You know what he taught me? There's power in the Word. So if you can just get the Word into hearts and minds, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, will use the Word. The well, second suggestion that I gave to my new friend on the flight was that she not only use the word that way, but use her own testimony. I mean by that, her story of how she came to know Jesus as her personal Savior. See, here's what I discovered. I discovered that lots of people that will not listen to a sermon will listen to a story. Lots of people who will not come into a meeting and listen to a guy like me for 30 minutes will listen to you Talk about what Jesus has done in your heart and in your life, and that is what we call the testimony. So the two tools, if you're keeping track of it, tool number one is the track. Tool number two is the testimony. And if you can learn to use your testimony and use a track, God can use you to get the gospel out. Let's all stand to our feet right now, would you please? Everybody stand. Very good. You're listening so well. I want you to gather all your things again. I need a piano player again just for a second. Could I have a pianist up here? Somebody that knows how to, very good. I wish I could just go to a piano and play, but that's not my gift. Very good. You got all your things? All right, here's what you're going to do. You are going to shake hands with seven people now that you have not yet spoken to today. Sound vaguely familiar? And you must find a different partner this time. Some of you say, man, I really like this partner. Tell them goodbye. You'll talk to them later, all right? Now, listen to me. Listen to me. Shh, look here. 
This is going to be like a little intermission, but you're really not allowed to leave, all right? I just want you to mingle, speak to one another, watch, speak to seven people, then find a new partner, guys with guys, girls with girls, and sit with your new partner. And when you sit down, I'm not going to give you any instruction. I want you to get acquainted with them just like you did the first partner, all right? And then I'm going to come back and talk to you kind of round two about how to use your testimony. Ready? On your mark, get set, go. All right. Everybody got a partner? Got a seat? Partner and seat? Partner and seat? Very good. Very good. Have you gotten acquainted with your new partner? Yes? Good. On the count of three, shout out their name. If you don't have it, you got three seconds to figure it out. All right? One, two, three. Isn't that a nice name? And a nice person. Very good. Open your Bible with me again. Would you please still got your Bible with you? Let's go back to Romans. We were in Romans 1 16. I want you to go to the other end of the book for just a second. I want you to go to Romans chapter 10. Everybody look at Romans 10. We like to go to Romans 10 to talk to lost people. I want to take you to Romans 10 to show you a principle. Now, Romans 10 verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. In other words, he's basically saying it's not hard to be saved. The Lord's made it simple, the way plain. God is near you. The Lord has showed you what you need. Look at verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Everybody circle verse 9 in your Bible. That's one of the greatest salvation verses to take someone to. So if you're looking for a great verse to use to show people who want to be saved how they can be saved, take them to Romans 10 verse 9. Look at verse 10. For with a heart, Man believeth unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made into salvation. Notice the divine order in verse 10. Which comes first, heart or mouth? Let's try that again. Everybody look at verse 10. Which comes first, heart or mouth? Heart always comes first with God. 
It's not just praying a prayer, signing a card, joining a church. It's not just what you say. It's your heart. With your heart, you believe. With your mouth, you confess. There's a divine order. There's a logical progression here. Look at verse 11. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be... What's that word, please? Everybody remember Romans 1.16? I am not what? Ashamed. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be what? Ashamed. Look, if the world is proud of their sin, don't you think we ought to be proud of our Savior? If they're unashamed to pray through the streets debauchery and wickedness, don't you think God's people ought to be so excited about knowing Jesus that we want others to know? Look at verse 12, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Well, that sounds a lot like Romans 1 16 again, doesn't it? For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I like to use this verse. I like to take the word whosoever and put somebody's name in. What's your name? Shiloh? That's a good name. That means peace, right? If you take the word whosoever out, put the name Shiloh in, it says, for Shiloh shall call upon the name of the Lord, Shiloh shall be saved. What's your name? Gracie? For if Gracie shall call upon the name of the Lord, Gracie shall be saved. What's your name? Andrew? For if Andrew shall call upon the name of the Lord, Andrew shall be saved. How many you want me to do today? Whosoever means whosoever. And then you come to the verse I want you to see. Look at verse 14. Let's read verse 14 out loud together. You got it in front of you? Romans 10, verse 14. Ready? Read. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Questions. Look at all the questions. They just make sense. You can't call on somebody you haven't believed on. You can't believe on somebody you haven't heard about. And you can't hear about somebody unless somebody tells you. So that's where we come in. And the word preacher here does not mean a guy like me that gives sermons. The word preacher here means people like you who know Jesus and give the gospel. That's what Mark 16, 15 says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You may never preach a sermon, but you should preach the gospel. This is the preaching every Christian should do. So let's talk about the second tool, all right? The first was, look up here, this. The second is something you actually carry with you already all the time, whether you realize it or not. We call it a testimony. That's a big word for simply your story. Somebody witnesses a crime, the police come, and they want to get your eyewitness what? Testimony. You simply say what you saw. You simply tell what you heard. You simply relay the details of what you have experienced. That's it. So if you know Jesus as your Savior, you can share it. 39 years ago, I started asking questions about God, about heaven, about hell. I didn't know. I went to a lady one day, not a preacher, but she preached the gospel to me, a lady, and I started asking her questions, and she sat me down with a Bible, and she explained to me from the Bible how I could know the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior. She told me God loved me. She told me Jesus died for me. She told me Jesus rose from the dead. Then she told me the most important thing. That he not only died, he died for my sins, and that he not only rose from the dead, he rose from the dead so I could have eternal life. And on that day, I prayed a simple prayer. I do not remember what I prayed. It's not some magic formula prayer. You've got to say the right words. No, no. It's not your prayer that saves you. It's not even the strength of your faith that saves you. It's the object of your faith. It's the one you're praying to. It's the Lord Jesus that saves you. And on that day, as a five-year-old boy, I asked Christ to be my Savior, and the Lord saved me. What I just did in about 60 or 90 seconds was I just explained to you, watch this, not only how I got saved, but how you could be saved if you weren't. You see, your testimony is a tool, it's a means, it's a method of delivering the same gospel message. And here's what I've discovered. Many people who will not sit and have a Bible study with you would listen to you say, let me just tell you, this is why I wanted to talk to you. This is what God did in my life. And it's a funny thing. People relate to people. It makes the story, the truth come alive because now they know someone who has experienced this for themselves. Now, there are three parts to a good testimony. Everybody put three fingers out in front of you, all right? Three fingers. Pick either hand that has three fingers, all right? Three fingers. Three parts to a good testimony. Everybody grab your index finger and let me give you the first one, all right? The first one is your life before you got saved. 
We might say B.C., before Christ, all right? So let's just say that. Ready? Before Christ. Ready? Before Christ. What's the first part? Before Christ. One more time. What is it? So you want to explain to them that you were a sinner. Now, why is that important? Because sometimes we have a tendency, especially those of us who've been saved a little while, to almost talk down to people like they're the sinner. Hold up just a second. I think we're all sinners, aren't we? So you, you find a common entry point here to explain to them, look, before I knew Jesus, I, I was lost. I didn't know God. Um, let me tell you what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't tell them every bad thing you've ever done. Sometimes people get talking about their story, and they start going into, like, gross details of sin, and I did this, and I did everything in the book, and then I did this. That exalts the devil and sin, not Jesus. So you want to major on the fact you didn't know God, you didn't have peace, there was no joy, you're trying to figure out your purpose, you didn't know where you are going to go when you die, whatever. you got to make that personal yourself. But number one, your life, say it please, before Christ. All right? Grab the second finger, would you please? The second part of a good testimony is how you came to know Jesus. Say that please. How you came to know Jesus. Say it again. How you came to know Jesus. Turn to the person next to you. Let's review. Grab the first finger. First finger is what? Before Christ. Second finger is what? How you came to know Jesus. One more time. First finger is what? Before Christ. Second finger is how you came to know Jesus. Third finger is what Jesus means to you now. Now that you are saved... Now that you actually know him, what difference has it made? Look, do you love Jesus? Has he made a difference in your life? Uh, has God given you peace? Do you have assurance where you're going when you die? Do you get answers to prayer? Does God show you things from his word? Are you glad to be a part of the family of God, the greatest family on earth? Think about all the things, <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews talks about things that accompany salvation. All that you got when you got Jesus. You can't talk about all of him. You can't even think about all of them. But you can talk about something. Look, the person you're sharing your testimony with, why should they want your Christ? Why should they want to know your Jesus? This is what Christ means to me now that I'm saved. Let's review. Everybody turn to your neighbor. Let's review. Number one is what? Before Christ. Number two, how I came to know Christ. Number three, what Christ means to me now that I'm saved. All right? Now, let me give you three suggestions. Go to the other hand. Let me give you three suggestions, all right? If you want to write these down, they are these. Number one, speak more about Christ than about yourself. Sometimes when people share their story, it's all about them. <clears throat> By the way, when you share your story, don't give your whole life story. Some people back up at, to their birth and come forward. You know, that's not cool. Uh, nobody wants to hear all of it, all right? So we're talking about your salvation story, how you came to know Jesus. Years ago, I was walking across the campus of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee, 26,000 students on campus. That's a mission field. I bump into this guy on a corner. I give him a gospel track. <clears throat> He's interested. He says to me, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about spiritual things. He said, I don't have long. I'm walking to work. Can you walk with me? Now, I know I've only got two or three long blocks until we're where he works. So immediately, instead of launching into some long extended something, let me tell you what I did. I went straight to my gospel testimony. I wove gospel verses in it like John 3, 16. I tried to share my story in such a way so this fellow could learn between where we were and where we were going not just how I became a Christian, but how he could become a follower of the Lord Jesus himself. Two or three blocks later, we paused. He said to me, thank you for sharing this with me. He said, this is where I work. I've got to go in now. And I said to my newfound friend, I knew God was working in his heart. It was obvious. I mean, the Lord had him ready. He was ripe. And I said to him, would you like to trust Jesus as your Savior? He said, oh, yes, I would. And I said, would you be willing right here on this street corner, people walking past us, would you be willing right here to call on Jesus and ask him to be your Savior? He said, I would. And standing right there in front of his place of employment with people walking around us, he bowed his head and he called on the Lord and was wonderfully saved. May I say to you, there is power in a personal testimony. But this is very important. Your story is not really your story. It's the story of Jesus working in your life. So number one, I say, talk more about Christ than you. 
The second suggestion I would give you is this. Speak more about how they can be saved than just all of the minor details about your salvation experience. <laughs> like, I hear people give their salvation story sometime, and they're like, well, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and, you know, it was about 90 degrees outside, and there was these, a lot of people there, and the preacher, he really did good, and, you know, it was just a beautiful day. The birds were whistling Dixie. And I mean, you know, they're going through all of these details that really don't matter, that are not connected to the gospel. You know what those are? Distractions. In fact, you could almost give people the idea that if they weren't your same age and didn't have your same feelings, didn't have the same circumstances, that they couldn't be saved. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ and what that means to a sinner. So you want to major on the majors and leave out all the fluff. And then the third suggestion I would give you is this. Speak more about the present than about the past. Now, this is very important. Sometimes when people share their story, it's all past tense. It's all 30 years ago. It's all 10 years ago at summer camp. Wait a minute. Is Jesus with you today? I mean, he said he'd never leave you nor forsake you. He said he'd be with you all the way to the end of the world. What does Christ mean to you today? That's where the third part comes in. I think it's the most neglected part of a good testimony. God is not a past tense God. Amen to that? He's a present tense God. His name is I am. So if he is, then you ought to talk about what the Lord means to you right where you are. So let's review and not just the three suggestions. Let's review the three parts of a good testimony. Everybody get your three fingers out. Ready? Grab the first finger. It is what? Before Christ. Second finger, how I came to know Jesus. Third finger, what Jesus means to me now. Everybody got it? We're going to use it. Practice makes perfect. Here's what I know. If you won't do it in here, you won't do it out there. Look, you don't have to lecture and preach a sermon. Uh, matter of fact, I'd recommend you not take your preaching finger and point at that center and talk to them, all right? Just be conversational. Have a talk. Explain it. And I'll tell you this. The first time you do it, you might be a little rusty. That's okay. You might stumble today. No problem. We're among friends. Everybody look at the friend next to you. See that? That's a friend, not an enemy. All right? They're rooting for you, and they're going in just a minute. So, everybody take a deep breath. Oh, very good. Relax. All right? You're not going to do it perfectly, but we're just working on learning how to do it at all. Some of you have given your testimony. Some of you never have, but all of us, if you know Jesus, can do this. Captain? Oh, we didn't get a captain in this group, did we? Oh, yes, yes, yes. All right, let's do it different. Let's do it different this time. Uh, figure out whose birthday comes first in the year. Ready? Go right now. You've got 10 seconds. Whose birthday comes first? All right. First birthday person, raise your hand. First birthday person, raise your hand. Aren't you lucky you got born early in the year? Very good. All right. So the first birthday person is going to share about their new birth first. When I say go, you go. When I say stop, you stop. And I want the other person just to sit there and be pleasant. Matter of fact, have a pleasant look on your face and just listen because in a minute, it's going to be your turn. All right? Ready? On your mark, get set, go. All right, stop. Look at me. How many of you, that was your first time ever doing that? Would you raise your hand? First time ever. 
Be honest now. How many first time in a long time? Yeah. All right. Now, look, let's just get real for a minute. How many of you would say that was challenging? It was a little difficult. All right, let me tell you what I've learned. Everybody look at me, please. Everybody look at me. I have learned the more you do it, the easier it gets. It's like talking about a ball team that you like or talking about a hobby that you enjoy. The more you talk about something, the more it becomes a part of who you are and your ability to talk about it improves. So that's why we're doing it today. It will get easier as you do it. All right? Second birthday person, it's your turn. Ready? Go. All right, stop. Look back at me. I know some of you may not be finished. It's all right. But we're learning. We're learning. We're working at it. Now, we're going to do it one more time. And here's what I want to do. I want to take the two tools we've talked about today and use both of them. Okay? So the first one, everybody get it in your hand, was this gospel track. Let's look at it just for a second. And the pastor may talk more about it in a little bit, what's in it, why he wrote it this way. It's very well done. But the first thing in it is John 3.16. So if you don't have another verse, you can use John 3.16. Agree? That's enough. Here's what I want you to do. I'd like you to begin your conversation this time by introducing yourself as if you don't know the person. Get their name. Give them this. However you want to start the conversation. Let me give you something encouraging to read. This is what Jesus did in my life. But some entry point. Then I want you to give your gospel testimony again. All right? We're practicing. And how you came to know Jesus. And then, when you get to the end of your testimony, I'd like you to share at least John 3.16 with them. All right? You don't have to go through the whole thing. But at least, let me show you a verse that really has helped me understand how I could be saved. This is how you can be saved. And just kind of talk about John 3.16 with them for just a moment. You don't have to preach a sermon. Just try to explain it a little bit. God loves you. Jesus died for you. This is why he died. He wants you to have eternal life. He wants you to go to heaven someday. The, you know the two hardest things to do? Brother uh, Matt, you're a pilot. Takeoff and landing, pretty big deal, right? Isn't that interesting? I think the two hardest things to do in witnessing are take off and land. How do you start? How do you stop? It's kind of like bookends, you know? I get nervous on both ends, frankly. Today, I've taught you two ways to take off. Begin with a track. Begin with your testimony. Get into it. Get them the gospel. When you get to the end, how do you land the plane? How do you bring it in? How do you, as we used this analogy earlier, how do you draw the net? How do you do that? What I do, I'm just telling you what I do. What I do, after I've explained that, many times I'll ask them if they have questions. I'm not just talking at them. I want to have a talk with them. I want to be sure they understand Sometimes I'll review. I'll go back. Wow, we just got a lot of power there. I hope it's Holy Ghost power. Um, I'll, I'll go back and review just a little bit. And I'll say to them, uh, look, do you understand that God loves you and Jesus died for you? Do you want to know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? Oh, yes. Uh, if they don't, you can't push them. You can't make them. You can't save anybody. You don't get to choose for them. They must choose to put their own faith in Jesus Christ. But if they understand what I've just explained to them from the gospel, 
and I'm able to answer their questions, then I'll say to them, look, I'd like to have a prayer with you. I really would. I'd like to have a prayer with you. And I want to pray for you. And then I'd like to give you an opportunity to pray with me and ask Jesus to be your Savior. Would you be willing to do that today? And then if they're willing to do that, I pray for them. And instead of saying amen, then I say, now, Josh, now why don't you pray with me? Sometimes people want to pray their own words. Sometimes I'll lead them in a prayer. This particular little gospel piece has a little, little prayer in it, I think, that you can use right there in the fold. Uh, and I'll help them just kind of walk through it. Because some people say, I don't know how to pray, sir. I, I, I've never prayed before in my life. I don't know what to say. It's all right. And the important thing is not that you say the right words, is that you know you're talking to God and that you make this your own and you're putting your faith in him. And so we end in prayer. Now, everybody look me in the eye just a second. I don't ever like making a mockery of people being saved. I'm just, I don't, I don't like that. I don't think that's good. I like practicing witnessing and given our gospel testimony, I don't like a mock, make a mockery of people praying to be saved. Because Jesus died for your sins once. And at some definite point, one definite point in your life, you come to call on the Lord for salvation and are saved. But I want to say this. I want to end with prayer today. And I want to say this. There could be somebody in the room that you're not a Christian. And let's just get blunt. There could be somebody here, you're not a Christian. I mean, you're sitting here, we're going through the motions, but you're not sure you're saved. I want you to be an honest person today. I don't want you to make something up, pretend some way. God deliver us from, from being fake. If you're not sure you're a Christian, I want you to tell the person that you're with, look, I, I need to be saved. I need to be saved. And maybe the two of you can go through this track together, read it together, and then when we have our time of prayer, I want you to pray right where you sit and ask Jesus to be your Savior. I'm serious. I, I, it would be wonderful to know somebody in this room today came to know Jesus as their personal Savior. And by the way, some of you may be sitting next to somebody. They're not really a Christian, and God puts you with them for a reason. So you could explain how you got saved and talk to them and help them come to know Christ as their Savior today. And so when we have our prayer time, if you're not saved, that's what I want you to do. When we have our prayer time in just a few moments, if you are a Christian, we're going to pray for people to be saved by name, and we're going to pray that God will use us. Sound good? Let's begin by talking to one another, then we'll talk to God, all right? Let's let the, the second birthday person go first this time, all right? Instead of flipping a coin, we'll turn it around. Second birthday person, now listen to me. You're going to use the track, use your testimony, and explain John 3.16. That's it. That's all you're going to do. Then you're going to stop. Ready on your mark, get set, go. All right, stop. Look at me just a second. You may be finished, you may not. Uh, let's, look, we're just being real here. We're all friends, all right? How many of you stumbled a little bit? Okay. Anybody get to a certain point and felt like I got stuck? I didn't know what to do there. Okay. Can I just let you in a little secret? We all get there sometimes. 
That's why you have to pray, Holy Spirit, help me, and depend on the Lord to bring to your mind the things you need to say. But let me give you a little help that I think will encourage you. Nobody gets saved because you did a good job speaking. We're not trying to make you mechanical like, you know, you push your nose and you start talking and pull your ear and stop. You know, it's not like you're just reciting something. Speak from your heart. Look, when people are having real conversations, sometimes they get stuck, right? Sometimes they stumble over a word. They say whatever. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Don't worry about it. You don't have to apologize. Just back up if you need to. Pick up where you left off. Partner, it's your turn. Ready? Go. All right, stop. Look back at me now. Now, here's what we're going to do. We've had a lot of fun doing this. And I, by the way, I love seeing you doing this. Let me ask you a question. If this, is, if this brings so much joy, people talking about the Lord, I mean, I'm looking at your countenances, people smiling, talking, and enjoying talking about Christ. Imagine what that kind of joy could do in your school. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. This is your year. To stand up and speak out and be counted for Christ. And that's what we're praying, that God will use you to make a difference for the Lord by not being ashamed of the gospel. Now, for the next few minutes, we're going to do something a little different. Instead of just talking to each other, we're going to spend a few moments talking to God. And uh, prayer is just as natural as talking to one another. You're talking to a real person. He's here. He's everywhere. And you don't have to pray some great polished prayer. Somebody says, I don't know how to pray. Yes, if you know how to talk, talking this way instead of talking this way, that's prayer. You're talking to the Lord. I want you to do something for just a moment. If there's someone in the room and you're not sure you're saved, I want you to be honest with your partner and just tell them, I'm, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. And I want you to pray right where you are and invite the Lord Jesus into your life today to be your Savior. I'm serious. And let's, let's let this be the first of some young person coming to Christ this year. Uh, you, you get it settled today. But if you're like so many who raised their hand a while ago and said, I know I'm a Christian, I want you to share with your partner somebody you're praying to be saved, somebody you're praying for. It may be a family member, a friend, a classmate, a coworker, a ball team member, somebody. You might have two or three. That's fine. You ought to start you a list of people you're praying for to be saved. But let's, let's at least share one. And then, once both of you have done that, I want the two of you to pray together. I want you to pray by name for the people who need to be saved. You may even want to write them down so you'll remember their names. I want you to pray for them by name. I want you to pray for yourself, and I want you to pray for your partner here today by name. So, again, if you're like me and you've already forgotten their name, you're going to need to get it. All right? I want you to pray for your partner and you that God will use both of you to make a difference in your school for Jesus this year. One of you can begin the prayer. The other one can close the prayer. We're not in any rush. We're not in a hurry. And after a few minutes of people being able to pray together, I'll come back and close our time of prayer. 
And let's pray that God will use us. And let's pray for people to be saved. All right? Talk and pray with your partner now, please. And now, our Father, I pray over these young people, every young man, every young lady in this room. Dear God, may they be certain of their salvation. May they live like Christians this year. May they live in such a way that others will know their faith is real, their God is real. But then please put in them a holy boldness to speak about Jesus Christ, to share their faith to give the gospel. Give them wisdom to know what to say, discernment to know when to say it, grace and love to know how to say it. Use them, Lord. Use them mightily. And I pray with them for those that they know and love who need Christ. Prepare their hearts. Get them ready. Lord, may this be a year of young people being saved in our schools, in our communities. Set it in motion today. And I thank you for it. And before I close the prayer with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, nobody looking but me, I want to ask a couple questions. To be honest, question number one, is there somebody in here today that would say, Brother Scott, I'm that person you were kind of talking to earlier that wasn't sure of my own salvation. And I've sat here today and I've listened to the gospel. I've listened maybe to somebody else's testimony. I get it. And the Holy Spirit's convicted me that I needed Jesus. And this morning, right where I'm sitting, I prayed and I asked Christ to be my Savior. I'm, I'm like that girl you were talking about in Connecticut. I prayed today myself and settled my own soul salvation. And I want you to know it. I'm not ashamed to tell you. I want you to raise your hand in the air with mine right now. 
If that's you, you say, I prayed today and I invited Jesus into my life to be my Savior. I'm looking carefully now. Anyone at all? Raise it up big and high where I can see it. I prayed today. All right, then best I can tell, I'm speaking to Christians. So I'm going to give you a challenge. Here's the challenge. Will you take this challenge? Will you make this commitment? How many of you will take a challenge and make a commitment that in the first week of school, and I'm not talking about later, I'm talking about immediately. You have a very short window to get started. In the first week of school, you will carry gospel tracts with you and you will try with God's help and he'll help you during your first week of school to give your testimony, your gospel story to at least one person. You may give out many tracts, but you'll try to have a conversation and give your story to at least one person at your school in the first week. I want you to raise your hand as high in there as you can get it. Keep it up right now, would you please? That's wonderful. I want you to lower your hand and right where you sit, I want you to tell God what you just told me right now. I want you to say to the Lord, Lord, I'll do that. Help me. Use me. Oh, Lord, what a thrilling thing. And I pray that there'll be a great number of people saved in the days ahead and that you'll teach these young people not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In Jesus' name. And all God's young people said, amen. Well, I want Brother Sexton to come and tell us more about this track. You know, I was with him all day yesterday. I don't know when I started coming down here to this youth meeting. It's one of my favorites to be in. But would you look at me just for a second? I admire, this man started this church 32 years ago, yesterday. Still, not just still pastoring it, still passionate about it. And he has two great loves, this generation and the gospel. And I love that and connecting those two. And I know that's why I wrote this track. It's a very special track. He's got thousands of them available for you to take today. So he needs to explain to us why he wrote it, the idea behind it. I think that'll make it mean more to you. And then I hope you'll let him know sometime during the day today how much we appreciate them hosting this and helping all of us. Thank you, Brother Scott. I love it, don't you? And uh, I am so grateful you're here today. We, uh, we love young people, and I truly believe, honestly, that only the youth can carry our nation forward. Only youth can save this nation. It's an amazing thing what God can do with young people who surrender their life. I, um, I've been writing tracks for a long time. This track is about John 3.16, and uh, it tells four great truths. I've had the privilege of being uh, going to 45 different nations around the world and preaching to young people and uh, sharing the gospel and seeing many of them come to know Christ. And um, I've discovered something about people. God created us with a real need. You have a need and I have a need. And God created us with a need. Number one, he's created us with a need to be loved. Do you know everybody in the world wants to be loved? Don't you want to be loved? Don't you want somebody to love you? God created us not only with a need to be loved, but God created us with a need to feel of worth. So many people do not feel of worth. They just don't feel of worth. And how sad that is that people uh, do not feel of worth. But God created us, created us with a need to feel of worth. Thirdly, God created us with a need to have hope. You know, people are, homes are falling apart. Marriages are falling apart. Young people seem to be just left out, uh, outside of so much. And they've lost hope. And then God created us with a need to have purpose for our life. Now, what's amazing is this verse, John 3, 16, tells us those four things. It tells us, first of all, that we're loved. For God so loved the world. God loves you. Aren't you glad God loves you? Number two, it tells how much you're worth. How much are you worth? That he gave his only begotten son. It also tells you can have hope that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And then it tells you what you can do with your life, but have everlasting life. Purpose. So God wants people to know their love, their worth, their life, there's hope, and their life can have purpose. Now that's why I love this track, because those four things are in this track. 
But one great truth changed my life. Have you ever got a hold of something that just changed you completely? Completely. Well, truth changed my life, and I want to illustrate that truth for you today. I want you to imagine, I'll get these two young men to help me. I want you to, you help me if you would. I want you to imagine, now you, you come, and I want you to imagine, and it's going to take some kind of imagination. I want you to imagine that this is God. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? We never knew what you looked like. Oh. And I want you to imagine this young man right over here. This young man is someone who does not know God. I want you to have a seat right here. Now, I want to ask God a question. Now, this is God. I want you to imagine this now. I want to ask God, do you love people? Yes. Do you want to see everybody saved? Yes. Do you want to see him saved? Yes. Now, here's what God does. He's done everything he could possibly do. He died for our sins. He wants everybody to be saved. He wants him to be saved. So I'm going to ask God to do something. God, would you go tell him how to know you? And God says, I cannot go for you, but I will go with you. God says, I cannot go for you, but I can go with you. He said, I can't go for you, but I'll go with you. And I said, well, wait a minute. Please, God, you love him. You want him to go to heaven. Why don't you go tell him how to be saved? I can't go with you. I can go for you. With you. I can't go for you. I can't go for you. Go with See, you. not all gods are as smart as our God, right? God says, I, I can't go for you. But I'll go with you. I'll go with you. Now, here's what I learned that changed my life. You ready? A person that doesn't know God never has God do anything in their life to tell them how to be saved until we make our first contact. So you can pray, Lord, I want you to pray. I want you to save that guy. God said, I want to save him more than you do. But I can't go for you. Then go with you. Well, say, Lord, why don't you go? I'm afraid. Can't go for you. Then go with you. And so when you go, get your track. Let me have the track. So here's a gospel track. Now, I'm going and God's going with me. Now watch. When I tell him God loves you, that's the first time that God starts working in his life to bring him to salvation. Because he that which has begun a good work in you will perform it in the day of Christ. Now, I'll go on with my life, and God goes with me, but God now begins to speak to his heart. If you were walking down the street, and you saw a hundred people sitting on the street, and you would say to God, I wish that all hundred people would be saved, God would say, I can't go for you. I can go with you. God wants to see them saved, but until we tell them, they can't be saved. You're going to walk past all of the young people you know in school, your peers. Many of them do not know the Lord. And they wonder, does anybody love me? Am I of worth? Is there any hope for me? Can my life have a purpose? And we know God can answer that question. We say, God, will you please work in their life and save them? Yes. Will you go tell them how to be saved? Can't go for you. I can go with you. God wants them saved more than we ever imagined, but God cannot do anything until we first talk to him about Jesus. And that's what changed my life. So every time you give somebody a, thank you, fellas, every time you give somebody a gospel track, it begins a work of God in their life. Brother Matt, come on down just a second, would you? Brother Matt Burks, one of our fine men, he's traveled with me to nations around the world. He's done a great job. He's seen thousands of people saved. Thousands of people saved. And I've heard his testimony so many times. Can you imagine, do you think Matt got saved in a church service? How many think he got saved in a church service? No. 
How many think you got saved in jail? Oh, more believe you got saved in jail. I want Matt to tell you how he got saved. Come on, Matt. I want you to tell him how you got saved. 1989, I was living in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, 1989, that was back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and before there was cell phones and internet and all those things. But I was living in Memphis, Tennessee. I was out of high school. I had grown up in Germantown, Tennessee. And uh, Germantown's a place where Baptist churches were everywhere. I didn't know that. But not one person the entire time I was in high school ever gave me a gospel track or witness to me. And, uh, but 1989, I was out of, um, out of school and I was actually working a couple different jobs. I was getting ready to go to aviation school in uh, Fort Scott, Kansas, but I was working at a pizza place in Memphis, Tennessee, delivering pizzas at night, working for UPS during the day. And, uh, the, the pizza shop was owned by FedEx pilots and I was going to be a pilot. I wanted to get around those guys. And while I was delivering pizzas, and this was shortly before I moved out of the city. I was, went to a door one night, and a man asked me a simple question. And, you know, I was 22 years old at that time, and, um, you know, all kinds of things had built up in my life. I was really at a place where I was just getting despondent and didn't know, wondered why I was created, had filled myself up on everything the world had to offer. And uh, just feeling very empty. It looked like I was having a good time on the outside, you know, kind of a wild-eyed southern boy, you know. It seemed like we were having fun, but the truth was inside, I was sad. I just, I really wondered, you know, what I was going to do with myself. And but I went to a door one night making a delivery at an apartment there in Memphis, Tennessee. I can still see the man right now, but he opened the door, and I brought him his delivery, and he asked me a one question. He looked at me and said, do you know the Lord? And I said, you know, my family's religious and, and, and whatnot. I just kind of, he said, I'm going to get you something to read. I can still see him now. He went over and he was getting the money out to pay me and, and those kind of things. And he brought me a simple gospel track. And it looked like a credit card. It looked like a master card. And it said, give the master charge of your life. And he gave me that. And he said, I'm going to give you something to read. And that's all he did. And I took that, and I know by the way I looked at the time, he probably thought on the way to the car, I just did this and threw it in the bushes. What he doesn't know is I sat in his parking lot for about 20 minutes. I had a Jeep, and I sat in my Jeep, and I read that track over and over again. It was just a simple gospel track that said, had the, had the Romans road on it, for all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. And I started reading that track. And at that moment, that night, Christianity wasn't a thing anymore. It was a person. And the person of God, it was him that I met with sitting in my Jeep. And I sat in my Jeep, and 20 times I went over that. And I said, Lord, I don't trust myself. You know, I don't, I don't know how this works. But if you're saying to me that all I have to do is ask you to come into my heart and save me, I said, I'm going to do that right now. And I thought in my mind... I was thinking things like, didn't man write the Bible and all these things? And I just said, Lord, I am going to take this at face value. I'm asking you to come into my heart and save me right now. And something changed in that, in that vehicle tonight. It wasn't something I was looking for. It was someone. And I met him through the gospel that night. I trusted Christ. Now, I went up the road from that time. It was, it was a few years before I got into church. I started visiting places and... But, you know, everywhere I went from that time, I had joy, I had peace. Something had done a 180-degree turn in my heart. A lot of things I was doing before that I was very comfortable with, I was no longer comfortable with them. They were making me miserable. And the only thing that gave me satisfaction was to get into the truth and the Word of God. But I went up the road from that point on. Everywhere I went, I seemed to meet a Christian after that. And I'd pull them aside and I'd try to talk to them. And I'm picking their brain. How does this thing work? I was just, I was listening to the radio and growing in the Lord, listening to radio preachers. And I would see some meeting going on on the side of the road. I'd stop and I'd walk in there like, who's in charge of this thing? I have some questions. And, and the Lord has just led me from that point on, just step by step, moment by moment. But from that point on, I had that joy and that peace that, uh, that you don't get any other place but from Jesus himself. Amen. 
Thank you. I want you to meet someone who got saved because somebody gave him a gospel track. That's pretty neat, isn't it? And uh, he's been able to go to so many places around the world and share his faith. God is good. Now, we're going to eat lunch in just a moment. How many are hungry? I saw a pizza truck come to the front of the place. Were they trying to bring us something? I think they were trying to give us some ideas or something. Anyway, so here's what we've got. We're going to have lunch, and then after lunch, we're going to go do some things. Now, we planned this meeting, and we're so excited you're here today. My goodness, am I excited you're here. I love you. I'm so thrilled at what God can do. By, by the way, now, I want you to take all this material you can possibly take, and we want to make sure this conference didn't cost you anything except your time, and uh, we, want, we, we want you to know. Now, the skating Oh, excuse me, not skating, the bowling that we're doing, you have to take care of that. But if you did not come prepared for that, just let us know and we'll take care of it for you. But we want you to enjoy today. We want you to, to know there are many young people who love God, who want to do something for God, and you need this encouragement. I really believe young people need encouragement today. And just to let them know, hey, we believe do you know, people that know your generation and study your generation, uh, they say this about the Z-Gens. Here's what they say, that it reminds them more of the great generation than any other generation. That's how much faith and confidence people have in you. They believe that you can change the world. Isn't that amazing? I believe you can too. So here's what we did. We, were, we wanted folk to come. And we got word about 60 people were coming. We said, okay, we'll plan for 70. Because we didn't know with all this crazy stuff going on. We have 170. That's pretty good, isn't it? Isn't that exciting? So that means we sliced the pizza a little thinner. No, I'm just kidding. You. <laughs> we ordered more pizza. But it also means we have to go to two different locations for activities, which is a bummer, but it's okay. So, how many want to go bowling? Let's see. Stand to your feet, if you would. The rest of you want to stay in our tour for the rest of the afternoon? No. How many, how many want to go bowling? Let's see. Stand up. You have to. Well, there's going to be bowling or... Okay. Okay. Thank you. You can be seated. We've got a bowling alley on Del Prado. And we got a bowling alley on, on Santa Barbara. Now, here's what we've got. Matt, you help me with this, okay? Come on down a minute. And so we're going to take, on Del Prado, uh, we, we can take 90 folk.